SoCal Connected is made possible through the generous support of the Amundsen Foundation, serving the Los Angeles community since 1952. Tonight. Hello, I'm Val Zavala. A very special edition of SoCal Connected. She's been a very important figure for these last three decades. She's been one of the most trusted journalists in Los Angeles for 30 years. President Reagan says he's on the right track when it comes to genuine arms control. I would characterize Val in one word, genuine. A real Swiss army knife of television production. I didn't want to be caught not knowing as much as Val did. Now. The end of an era. The word on the street is that you are retiring. It's going to be a loss for us. It's going to be a loss for the city. Join us for 30 years in 30 minutes as we look back and celebrate her distinguished career. It was worth the wait. When I started the KCT, I remember getting around with Thomas Brothers maps. The 105 freeway wasn't built yet. Downtown didn't exist. Silicon Beach wasn't even a word. So all these things have changed tremendously since I came to KCT. My first job after grad school was a gopher in the newsroom of Baltimore, in Baltimore, Maryland. I mean, that was a down and dirty blue collar newsroom. I learned a lot. But if you want to report, you have to go to a small town. You got to go to that small market. So I got the guts to put together a tape and I went to San Luis Obispo back in California. Thank God it brought me back to my home state. KSBY TV6. I'm Brian Hackney. And I'm Renee Zavala. Nutritionists continue to find that beans have more to offer than most people think. You might notice my co-anchor introduced me as Renee. That's actually my middle name and I used it for my first on-air job because I thought Renee Zavala was easier to understand than Val Zavala. We'll give it back to Renee. Thank you, Brian. When I was in commercial news, I was a general assignment reporter. So it's covering spot news. You're covering stories that have to be turned very quickly in a minute and a half. And you can do it, but you can't go in depth. That's a lot of charred earth, but it's the best way to keep Santa Margarita safe. By far, the biggest jump in my career was going from commercial news to public television. LA Mayor Tom Bradley praised a special LAPD narcotics team today. The unit targets drug selling by gangs. At KCT, my first job was to be a reporter for a little news cut-in that they had right after the news hour called 7.30 and later it was called Newsline. And we did short pieces, two, three-minute pieces that fit into that five-minute section of 7.25 to 7.30. And so we did local stories every night, uh, our little contribution. It's easy enough to make your own greenhouse effect. Just get in the car on a warm day roll up the window and wait a few minutes. Then it grew into a half hour show called by the year 2000, half hour public affairs show. Los Angeles, 2001. A satellite hovers hundreds of miles above the city, snapping pictures every 10 seconds and storing possible clues to drive by shootings, burglaries and other crimes committed below. That show was a great show. We looked at all the major challenges and what they would be like in whatever five, six, seven, eight years. Others fear technology will go too far, that use will turn to abuse. We'll explore these questions in the next half hour, but first, a glimpse at some high-tech detectives of the future. It was great because I think we got a lot of things right because the forecasts were always really dire. 75 toxic contamination sites in the five county region. And in many ways, a lot of those forecasts were very correct. Two irreplaceable drinking water aquifers are contaminated with industrial solvents. Environment was going to be a problem, population, housing was going to be scarce. So a lot of the forecasts were correct. What we didn't forecast was the incredible change in technology and innovation. We certainly didn't predict the internet or digital or communications that we have, you know, social media. We never used the word internet, by the way, once. <laughs> it just shows you how wrong you could be. I think we did a whole show about the future in the early 90s, and I don't think we said the word internet one time in that series. We saw the problems clearly, but we didn't see all the solutions. There were some solutions, but not nearly as many as actually ended up coming around. 
Life and Times was a nightly news and public affairs show, went on for a long time. That was really fantastic. It would end up being the longest running news and public affairs show in KCT history, 15 years. It was one of the few shows in which you could really talk about issues. Now, I mean in more than an eight or nine second soundbite. The issue? Biomedical nuclear waste that was buried here more than 50 years ago. Hypodermic needles and even the cremated remains of radioactive lab animals. The issues that we talked about were always well covered. Val did her homework. Is there anything that we could have done to have mitigated this attack? When 9-11 came along, it wasn't just New York and the East Coast. The entire country, the entire world was affected. So we brought on people who understood terrorism, who understood uh, Muslim-Christian relations, who understood East-West relations. Tell us a little bit about the Afghan community here, Afghan Americans. They're as concerned about the safety of our servicemen and the civilians How do you get to the culture? Well, now uh, what we're seeing as we try to pass this It was this his persistent homeland. coverage of the homeless problem that has earned him awards and criticism. Life in Times was one of the few shows in Los Angeles that brought city officials and leaders into the studio and put them on the spot on live TV. Have we made a physical, real difference? You know, even if we were going at warp speed now, it would still be too slow to overcome centuries of inequities. Life and Times ended in 2007, and shortly after that, SoCal Connected began. Tonight, on this edition of SoCal Connected. SoCal Connected gave me a chance to go even deeper into some complex issues. Meet Brian Darcy. He keeps a low profile, but wields plenty of power in LA politics. That interview, believe it or not, was the only one I was ever nervous about because I had heard that he was a bully. So you can see why if people are frustrated that they're doing their best to Certainly. conserve. Certainly, they're frustrated for a lot of different reasons. Their rates are going up. But they're saying, what about Generally, how they sacrifice? feel is not relevant. What, what about shared, shared well, they're sacrifice? They're saying, what about shared sacrifice? We're all hurting. Everyone, including well-paid IBW members, maybe ought to make a little sacrifice here. Why? Somebody should ask the tough questions. Somebody should find the um, un, unreported stories. Somebody should be there to be the balance between things. One of our producers really wanted to do a story about uh, women vets and sexual assault. And she found this incredible woman, Angie Peacock, who had gone through several assaults in the service. And she had a story to tell. She was one of the very first female vets to come forward with stories of sexual assault and what it meant and what a terrible toll it takes on her. And her story was out there in front and it eventually won an Emmy and made a big impact. I'm very proud of that one. Val always focused on taking a people angle and how does it affect someone? Can we find someone and walk through their shoes? And those are the type of stories Val really loved, the people stories. You know, right now the Me Too movement is really big about women and sexual assault and harassment in Hollywood. I remember doing that story 10 years ago with Gina Davis, who has been out in front of this issue well ahead of everybody else. She's been keeping track of how few women are in movies and how mediocre parts or what sexualized parts women get in movies, and that all feeds into the misogyny of Hollywood. She was out in front of that ages ago, and we did a story with her, and she was terrific. I wanted to get in there and change the message that they get from the beginning. So if kids see balanced worlds from the beginning, that's what they grow up to expect seeing. It's so funny to look back and say, hey, we were on that issue 10 years ago. Now it's finally coming to the forefront, thank God. But my God, sometimes it takes a while. By having uh, someone like her in front of the camera, someone whose name is well known within Civic LA, but also Latino LA, that's symbolically incredibly important of having that presence. Bilingual education, the Exide Battery Recycling Plant in Vernon. We're too dark to get the attention that Porter Ranch got. Val Savala was at the table in the last 30 years, making sure that Latino stories were being told along with LA stories, and that in fact, Latino and LA were one and the same. I appreciate not only her going out and doing journalism, but being a fantastic citizen. One of the best things about being a reporter and being able to do features is you can go to places 
that very few of us get to go to. How many people have a job where the job is go to this beautiful garden, go to the back shed of a little lady's house and find out all the incredible books she has about African American history. Go visit the fellow who has started a barrio symphony for young people, young musicians in East LA. Or go visit Disney Hall and go behind the main stage where you can see the huge organ from the back. <laughs> How many people can have jobs where it just lets you explore LA from angles not accessible to the public? So by being able to do that, we make it accessible to the public, and in the meantime, I have like the greatest job in the world. So this is an actual storm drain that's under right, miles and miles This is and what's under it. our streets that captures all the rain that flows off our houses, our sidewalks, our driveways. A lot of times you want stories to make an impact on the world, and you hope they do, but I have actually personally been impacted by stories that I've done. Emily uses chains that fill her 50-gallon barrels. She's got five of them. I did a story on a woman who has rain barrels all over and has managed to, in different ways, collect 90% of all the water that falls on her property, stays on her property. This is during the drought when water is really valuable. I say, why am I not collecting the rain that falls on my roof? Well, I do now because of her. This is what I sleep on it's right here. It's not like even a big, cushy yoga mat. Are you comfortable? How does it oh, your back? Oh, it's the best. We did a story on a young man who has managed to live his life with only 50 items. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Mm -hmm. Nine here. Right. That's his entire set of possessions, 50 things. And I thought, oh my gosh, if he can live on 50 things, I can certainly clean out my closet. <laughs> and I made like three trips to Goodwill the next weekend. A couple hundred acres of mainly orchards, cultivated with no pesticides, no insecticides, no herbicides. Went to this beautiful farm. They grow food like it should be grown in relationship to animals and plants and the natural soil. And they really produce beyond organic, beautiful food. And you realize what a toll our industrial farming takes on the quality of our soil and you realize the single biggest thing you can do as an individual for the environment is to go vegetarian. I have stopped eating almost all red meat for the last five years. Today we're gonna make a cheeseburger and french fries. It's raw, organic, and vegan. It's the most amazing cheeseburger you'll ever have. That was a cafe that opened. The chef believed in raw food, uncooked, but really, really tasty. Our burgers are made out of mushrooms, almonds, walnuts, and sunflower seeds. Our mayo is macadamia nuts. He did not even have a burner in the restaurant. Everything was raw and delicious. I thought, you know what, save myself the trouble. I don't really make a big mess with pots and pans. And it's so easy just to eat good raw food that is really satisfying. So yes, I like moved my diet over a little bit there. I don't know what heaven feels like, but I know it feels wonderful to be able to have a key to come in to bring my kids into and to know that they have their own home. We have done a lot of stories over the years about people who are really in dire straits because we cover low-income people, people who are really stressed. And I remember covering one story about a woman trying to find subsidized housing. She finally found it. She moved in. She had virtually no furniture. And I walked into her apartment and she had like bare mattresses, they were kind of new, but no sheets or blankets for her kids. And I remember thinking, she can't afford sheets yet, just, you know, a set of sheets. And it's so tempting just to get her some sheets and come back, here, have your kids sleep on sheets and pillows tonight. But our job is not social workers. Our job is to tell their story, to respect them, and to hopefully um, allow a larger community understand what they're going through and become more compassionate and empathetic. And in the long run, they're better off being connected with an organization. One of the great things about Val is not only do you see her on air, but you see her throughout the community. She actually goes out and covers it and, and is a part of it on her off time. And I, I think that says a lot. One of the things Val has really taught me is how to listen. Um, sometimes a journalist really gets mired in the questions and you know asking the right questions. But what Val really taught me was listening. And when she, you can see that when she interviews somebody, you feel like everything melts away and you're only talking to her. Oh, I think Val's had an amazing 
effect on, 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 on so many young journalists coming up. Things I've learned from Val. How to properly pronounce my name in a sign out. Um, to always look for the bigger picture and not sweat the small stuff. And that everybody has a story to tell. I don't think anyone sets out to be a mentor. Oh, I'm going to be a mentor. I'm going to be a role model for young people in 20 years. You know, it's one of those things that you, you, you go to your job, you do your job, um, you're thankful for the opportunity, and you build your career little by little by little. And then it's a secondary effect that, oh, gee, before you know it, people kind of know who you are. Or they say they admire you, or they say, oh, gee, you're a really you know, great role model for my young daughter who doesn't see many Latinos. So it, it sort of, it, it just, it, it sort of evolves or appears like leaves on a branch. You don't set out to, to be a role model. You set out to do a really good job in your career. And then you're very grateful when it helps others and when you can help others or when people ask for your help and, they, and you can be of service, absolutely. Then, then it's, it's just that wonderful byproduct. When you think about Val Savala, you think about the best storyteller that LA has to offer. I think of the top three to me are Larry Mantle, Warren Olney, and Val Savala. It's interesting that our careers were very parallel, but with the exception of the time that I was co-anchoring with Warren, we very seldom met in person. So this was a really wonderful opportunity. And I'm so grateful to Mount St. Mary's for letting us use that beautiful mansion. What do you guys see as a future of Los Angeles? The big issues, homelessness is, is one of yeah. them. And, I mean, personally, I think one of the biggest issues that's gonna continue to plague the city is this have, have, not divide. It's so structural, it's so deep, it's a very difficult problem. I mean, you still got this huge mm -hmm. gap. So despite all the jobs and, mm -hmm. and people making money, still can't afford to live somewhere. Suddenly, about whatever, 10 years ago, it took off. Now mm -hmm. downtown is booming, but the price of that is gentrification, homelessness, a huge number of people who can't afford to live here anymore. And homelessness is just sort of a mild way of putting it. Have you been to Skid Row lately? I had the other night uh, to drive around there. Uh, and it is an enormous area. It is, it's, for me, in the richest nation in the history of the world, uh, it is all of us, I think, are guilty of a kind of uh, sort of high level immorality to simply allow that to go on. We should simply say, no, we can't, we can't tolerate this. Our profession has probably changed as much as the city has, as much as the country has. Uh, journalism has gone through major, major transformations. Journalism looks easy when you watch it, but to do it right is a lot more difficult. And so a lot of people think, oh, I can be a journalist. All I have to do is get out and tell people what happened or write it up, and it's and it leads to, I think, a lot of the craziness we're seeing now. Journalism isn't what it used to be. I do think, though, that it's, that it's meant that people are seeking out reliable sources for, for information. You know, the change has been great, but it has its advantages, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. and, and now there's much more criticism, and I think there ought to be criticism mm -hmm. of journalism. And yes. we certainly should not be allowed to propagandize or to tell one story as opposed to another. And it's okay to be, you know, prove mm -hmm. what you're saying. You know, uh, what are your sources? Right. Much right. too much uh, is reported without attribution. So I have to ask you in retirement, are you going to be following Twitter and <laughs> being on top of social media, or do you feel like you're going to take a break from all that? Um, I'm not a big social media consumer to begin with, so I just, um, you know, I just subscribe to New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times online, and I'll continue to check in, but I will not feel compelled to check in, like, oh, I have to do it right away, I have to do it before I go to work. So I'm going to take it a lot slower, so it'll be less information dis uh, digested more slowly. Let me ask you this, in addition to Larry and me, <laughs> you have met some extraordinary people oh, in yeah. your time. Tell us a little bit about it. I remember it. doing an interview with Walter Cronkite. He'd just written a book. And I asked him, you've seen the history of America go by your desk. What do you see as the future? And he said, the United States will be an impoverished country. We are going to end up uh, as one of the poorer of the modern nations uh, in the world, particularly the Western nations. And I was shocked. I said, the United States, an impoverished country? And he said, yes because we're not investing in education, right. and this have-have-not divide will get only worse. We are right now uh, falling way behind 
in our education of our young people. Walter Cronkite actually listened to your question and answered uniquely your question, and so did Jimmy Carter. Some very prominent Jewish groups have criticized your book intensely, calling it biased, indecent, that it blames nearly everything on Israel. Do you agree that perhaps you blame Israel too much for their condition? No. no. Jimmy Carter was not just spouting off the same stuff. He listened. He actually had to think for a little bit before he answered. Extremely genuine. Uh, the Roadmap for Peace has been endorsed 100 percent by the Palestinians. Every major fa facet of the Roadmap for Peace has been rejected by the Israeli government. When stars from the entertainment community came on, at least when I was involved in sitting in that green room, they weren't there to hype their latest movie or their latest record. They were there because they were promoting a civic cause. I always like to ask them about something that was not necessarily their latest movie or their latest book. I like to ask them what do they really care about or what are the causes are they involved with. Cheech Marin, who is a fantastic comedian, his love is Chicano art. So to go to his house and see all the Chicano art that he's collected, that's what's so great. The first Chicano painting I ever saw was Amor Matizado by George Yepes. I was really intrigued by the images, and the more I saw of, of various Chicano painters, the more I saw this other story emerging. You said that you had had art training, but, but you're not an artist? No, I'm not an artist, uh, a, a visual artist. I have no ability <laughs> at it whatsoever, and I was told that. He is highly intelligent, super sophisticated guy. It's not his character at all in the movies. If you can get beyond that, that superficial image of, that many of these celebrities have, they're really amazing people that have a lot of depth and a lot of dimension. Well, as you've heard, I've been at KCT for three decades. Now, in the volatile world of TV news, that's a long time and a lot has changed. 30 years ago, if I said digital media, podcast, Facebook, YouTube, or blogs, you would have given me a blank stare. Now there's more journalism than ever. But quality, trustworthy journalism, that's rare. But we can't produce trustworthy journalism without you trusting us first. I mean, think about it. The hundreds of stories I've done required me and my camera crew to come into your homes, your schools, your offices. You've never met us before. We ask all sorts of questions. We come back, we write and edit the story. Then we put it on the air for the whole world to see, and you see it too for the first time. Now that's trust. And that's what I value most from you. Over the years, folks have asked me what famous people I've interviewed. And you saw some of them earlier, and yes, it's fun to meet celebrities. But Los Angeles wasn't formed by the famous or mapped out by movie stars. The real LA is made up of millions of regular folks who get up every day and do something. Something that makes our community safer, our environment cleaner, our children smarter and healthier. They make our institutions more just, hold our leaders accountable. They give our poor and homeless some relief and comfort. These are the people I admire most. And here are just a few of them. Brent Green plants hundreds of trees along our streets. Robin Petgrave teaches kids to fly. Leonor Ray Smith painted portraits of fallen soldiers for grieving families. Principal Yvonne Chan transformed a school and a neighborhood. Rick Hawthorne, a one-armed horseman, put disabled kids in the saddle. People ask me what I'm going to do in my retirement. Well, I like this quote by the writer E.B. White. He said, I arise in the morning torn between a desire to improve the world and a desire to enjoy the world. Well, I plan to do a good amount of both right here in Los Angeles. It's been an honor to serve you. 
Val, if you're reconsidering, if you're thinking about sticking around a little bit more, um, please do. But whatever your second act, your third act, your fourth act is, um, I look forward to it personally. And I would say personally, I wish you all the best. Enjoy your retirement, but I know you'll be very busy because there's no one who loves LA more than you. I am sending my best from across the miles. And listen, your money will go a lot farther down here in Houston. So in retirement, if you and your husband want to relocate down here, you can get a pool and tennis courts and a five-story house for about $5. So uh, maybe think about that, and I'll hopefully be seeing you soon. Val, thank you so much for being an extraordinary mentor and for giving me the opportunity to live out my dream to be a journalist. You taught me that it's more important to seek out the humanity than it is the spectacle, that everybody has a story to tell, and that more than anything, to get to the point. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Val, on 30 years of service at KCET. On behalf of City of Angels, thank you to a great angel in the city. And that's our program, I'm Val Zavala. And that's our program, I'm Val Zavala. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. We'll see you next time. We'll see you next time. I'm Val Zavala. We'll see you next time. No, you won't because I'm retiring.